Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's professional development session on lecturing with PowerPoint in Zoom or Google Slides. We'll talk about Google Slides as well. I'm Dave Giberson. I'm an old instructional design coordinator from Online Learning Pathways at the SDCCD. Uh, retired and come back from the, <laughs> the ash heap to help out with these uh, professional development sessions. Well, you know, PowerPoint takes a lot of takes a lot of abuse. It's been around for quite a while. It's not the new toy in the box anymore. Um, it can certainly be misused, leading to phrases like PowerPoint makes us stupid or death by PowerPoint. <laughs> We've all come close to that once or twice in the past. So it it it's kind of fashionable to uh, denigrate PowerPoint these days, but it's still one of the best visual aids that you can use to make your lectures, whether they be delivered in person in a classroom or on Zoom, as we're going to talk about today, to make your lectures pop and keep your students engaged interested and to amplify and illustrate what you're talking about in your lecture. And of course, it's it's fashionable in online education to denigrate the concept of a lecture now these days as well. Oh, we're supposed to, students are supposed to take charge of their own learning and and be proactive and um, and seek out their own uh, edification. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't think, you know, we've been lecturing since at least since the 600s AD when Oxford, Oxford was founded is a useful technique and it's not one that's going to disappear from either face to face or online education anytime soon either. So let's talk about how this presentation today is about how to do a little bit better under certain circumstances. So the mechanics of using PowerPoint in a Zoom meeting are occasionally a little uh, intimidating if you haven't done it before. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about today. Um, there are a series of steps that you can use. There's actually a number of ways to to use PowerPoint in a Zoom meeting, but I tried to pick a, a simple, straight algorithm, if you will, instead of uh, steps that will make it work. Starting up, of course, with bringing up PowerPoint on your computer and loading the presentation that you want to use in your uh, Zoom meeting. You can do this before or after you start your Zoom meeting. If you're if you want to be prepared in advance, you can do this beforehand. So, uh, loading PowerPoint on your computer is pretty similar to loading any other application. Uh, on a PC, you can just go to the Start menu and find it. I still use an older Start menu. <laughs> I never got over Windows Seven Start me menu, but. Um, Let's go to the Windows 10 menu here. That's more like it. And you can pull up, you know, if you've used PowerPoint recently, it will be available here in your recent um, apps that you've used, or you can find it in alphabetical order here uh, among all of your different apps. This looks a little different now, and it works slightly differently in Windows 11. Anybody out there upgraded to Windows 11 yet? Just curious. 11. Nobody, I, I finally got a, my laptop asked me to let it upgrade the other day and I did that. It, it's a little different. The start menu is a little different and so on. It's can't say that it's any better or worse. It's just different. But so everybody's probably still on Windows 10 at this point. Uh, and then we can start PowerPoint by just clicking on the appropriate uh, tile here in the, on the right or the name over here on the left. And there's PowerPoint. 
This is what PowerPoint 365 looks like. If you all don't have Office 36, access to Office 365 yet, uh, you should get that soon. My, the last I heard, and I'm no, um, uh, you know, I'm not plugged into the uh, information pipeline at the district uh, firmly anymore. But the last I heard, the contract faculty and employees were all going to get the full Office 365 suite provided to them through IT. You might have, if you haven't already gotten it, you might have to request it through your department head or your dean, probably your departmental secretary <laughs> is the person who will be able to connect you with that. And um, I think uh, non-contract faculty, we're going to get the the free tier of Office 365, but be included in the SDCCD account group so that they'd have access to um, uh, various resources provided by the district. What you're seeing here is the paid tier of uh, the, the pro tier of uh, PowerPoint 365, Microsoft's latest version of PowerPoint. Uh, so and I'm not sure if we're looking at what you're looking at. You're not looking at what I'm looking at. I didn't put it over on that screen. There's PowerPoint. Sorry about that. And uh, let me show you how I got into it again. In case that didn't come through either. Uh, let's see. We'll go to share screen. Share. Okay, now you're seeing my Zoom screen. And what I did there was go to my start menu, my Windows start menu, and just run PowerPoint by clicking on a tile here. Or I could have found it over here in the alphabetical list. And now you're seeing that. OK. And are you, you going to show how it's done on the Mac? Um, Let's see. Actually, I do have my Mac up over here. Or at least tell us. On the Mac, yeah. Probably it's it's simple enough on the Mac. On the Mac, it's either going to be in your ribbon at the bottom of the uh, screen, mm -hmm. or you'll find, or you may find a an icon for PowerPoint on your desktop, or you may have to go to your Applications folder in the Finder and run it from there. Thanks. Yeah because Apple doesn't have any equivalent of the start menu in Windows. Um, Does it matter if you have an older computer? Uh, no, not okay. much at all, because uh, Office 365 is primarily what's called software as a service. It runs in the cloud. And what you have on your local computer is just a little client that gives you access to that uh, software in the cloud. So uh, it will run fine. It's mostly running on Microsoft servers. So your computer is not as critical. The performance of your computer is not as critical as it used to be, which is one of the reasons they do it that way. The other reason they do it that way is that they can control updates and so on, and they can force you to subscribe to it <laughs> and pay them money every so often. I think that's what they're trying to do because I've had think? problems. <laughs> I've had problems with my Mac. I bought a new one and I'm still having trouble with it. So yeah, and you never know whether it's Microsoft or Apple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Especially when they do a new uh, software update. Uh, if I if we have a moment a little later on, I'll pull up. I've got a little Mac running over here. I can uh, put it into the meeting and show you that. That's a very reasonable. Um, request, I should have thought to do that beforehand. But right now it's it's going to, but once you get PowerPoint up, it's going to look the same on the Mac as it does on the PC, because it's really running uh, on in the cloud and not on your, most of it's running in the cloud, not on your local computer. Okay, so, uh, all right. So we bring up PowerPoint and load the presentation.
And we do that just by opening the presentation here, or one way to do it. We may see a presentation that we've used recently listed here already, or we can open a presentation and it will again show you things that you've opened recently, figuring that, that you're more likely to need that than anything else. Or you can scroll back in time and find your presentations, or you can search for a presentation by file name. So it so happens the one I want right now is this one. The way I brought this up earlier when I was checking everything and making sure everything would work. So I'll click on that. And up comes, so now I've got PowerPoint open. And I've got it um, ready to work with. I can either uh, edit it or I can present from. So let's go back to our, to my, I've got multiple PowerPoint presentations up at the same time. So I can show, share them with you. So we've done that. But you don't want your students seeing your view of PowerPoint. You want them to see the PowerPoint presentation itself. So uh, what you'll do after you bring PowerPoint up immediately is either minimize it, um, you know, just drop the window down into the taskbar on uh, or into the ribbon on the Mac or the taskbar in Windows and have it running but not displaying right that moment. So we can do that by just in Windows, just minimizing the uh, screen. Or if you have multiple monitors, show you how that works. If you have multiple monitors like so, I've got my uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, over here on uh, on my third monitor over here. So I just drag that over to another monitor and have it over there and have it out of view. So now, um, if I jump back to my Zoom, what Zoom is sending out, um, you're seeing my uh, PowerPoint slide that I'm presenting from for this presentation. And all I have to do is drag PowerPoint back onto that monitor when I need it. But for now, I've got it parked over here on another monitor. Get it out of the way. Really handy to have multiple monitors when you are presenting PowerPoint and Zoom. It's not essential, and I'm not assuming you have that in these, these uh, instructions, but it does make life a lot easier. Uh, it, having four monitors is a little bit of overkill. Um, I'm going for the he who dies with the most toys wins prize. But um, having two monitors on your system when you're uh, presenting, when you're running Zoom meetings, especially when you're presenting PowerPoint, is really handy. And uh, we've done sessions on how to get a second monitor attached to just about any computer, uh, any laptop or desktop computer. The, it's not terribly expensive anymore. Uh, monitors, particularly if you're willing to use a, an old monitor or something like that, can be had for, you know, way under a hundred bucks uh, in many cases. There are monitors that are perfectly fine. You use your iPad as an extra monitor. And it's real easy to do on a Mac and a little, little more complicated, but you can do it on a PC as well. Um, you can even, uh, if you have a desktop, Windows desktop computer and a Windows laptop, you can even use the screen on the laptop. If, if both the computers are on the same Wi-Fi network, you can use the screen on the laptop as a second monitor for the desktop. 
So there's lots of ways to get a second monitor attached to your system. And it is a tremendous productivity enhancement. And it gives you capabilities that are really quite cool. Like some of the capabilities I'm using today, when I put myself uh, in, over top of the PowerPoint slide as a talking head, I'm using, uh, so I'm doing something that requires me to have at least two monitors to do it. So th that's something that's well worth looking into. We have a recorded sessions on our open on demand site that will show you how to do that. I mean, step by step and with the video and, and show you how to configure the monitors and windows and Mac. Uh, so uh, I always try to proselytize for that. It really does make um, running Zoom meetings a lot more effective. Okay, let's gotta keep track of what you're seeing here. And thank you very much. If at any time, as has already happened today, I'm talking about something that you can't see, please let me know right away. <laughs> don't, don't stand on ceremony. All right. So we've done that. Start the Zoom meeting. Well, you, you might have already had your Zoom meeting running when you were brought up PowerPoint, or now you can start your Zoom meeting. Okay, we, we know how to do that, or that's the subject of another session. <laughs> and then typically you will share your screen in Zoom, which I'm doing right now. I'm sharing my Zoom screen with you. Um, you do that just by clicking on the share screen button in Zoom. Of course, the green button in the, your host menus at the bottom of the screen, you get a um, dialog box that pops up that asks you basically, what do you want to share? And I have four screens I can share here. Zoom's wonderfully uh, capable of dealing with computers with multiple monitors on it. So I can pick which screen I want to share with you. Uh, I'm sharing my Zoom screen right now, the one that I'm um, uh, operating from right now. And so I just select that and click share. And you're seeing my, uh, as you were before, you're seeing my screen on which I have my Zoom window, which allows me to show you how to do things in Zoom. That's a setting in Zoom that you can change that will allow you to do that. Normally, when you share your screen in Zoom, your Zoom window minimizes. And whatever was under, underneath it is shared with your attendees. But you can fix it so that that doesn't happen, so that your Zoom window can be shared with your attendees. And that's helpful when you're trying to show people how to do something in Zoom. So we've shared our screen in Zoom. And now we either maximize PowerPoint, we go down here to the into our taskbar or our ribbon on the Mac and find PowerPoint and bring it up onto our monitor if we only have one. Or if uh, we have multiple monitors, we just drag uh, PowerPoint over onto the monitor that's shared. Um, at um, the appropriate time, and then maximize it. And now we're ready to get started. So let's see what the let's bring the zoom back up here for a second. So what's next? If you want to record this, you'll need to start your recording at this point. I'm already recording, so I don't have to do that. But if I've already shared my screen, um, I'll have this Zoom toolbar. Come on. Just waiting on it to show up here. There we go. Um, I'll have this at the top of my screen. 
that allows me to control Zoom um, while uh, from this. And I can just go to the more menu here on the far right. And I can I have my recording controls up here. I can start my recording from here if I haven't already done so. You may or may not want to record your Zoom class meetings. That's entirely up to you. If you do record them, of course, be aware that uh, if student, if identifying information about students appears on the screen and is recorded, then you can only use that recording with the class, with the, the course section that uh, in which you record it. In other words, you can't take that recording and use it in another semester or with another class se section that you're teaching that uh, semester. That would be a FERPA violation. There are ways to minimize the amount of uh, student information that appears on the screen in Zoom when you record. But even so, if a student speaks up or something like that, you can hear their voice, then that's personally identifying information. That's You can't share that with anybody outside that class session, that course section. So it's best to use those Zoom recordings only with the um, class section in which they were recorded. In that event, you don't have to get releases or anything like that from the students. That's something that's allowable under FERPA. But uh, you do want to be sensitive to that and careful of it because it's a a FERPA violation is no, not anything that any of us want to have to deal with. Well, if you have more than one class, how, how do you keep them all separate? Now you got to be a little careful about uh, which recording was made in which class and, and be careful which one you share or, or who, who you share that recording with. Well, I think they're all in Canvas now, aren't they? Um, they're all in Canvas. Uh, if you have your course sections merged, then yes, the students are uh, all appear to be in one course shell for you, but they are in fact still in separate sections and they can't see one another's names and information like that. So no, that, uh, that doesn't uh, cut it. <clears throat> you can't share a recording that was made with one uh, cor uh, course section with another, nor can you can you legally invite all, let's say you have two sections of a particular class and you want everybody in the same Zoom meeting? Uh, that's not kosher mm. under FERPA. So it's aggravating, but true. And that would be like, you know, having all of the students meet together in the same classroom at the same time. So they'd be able to see one another and know who was in that, in the other section and so on. That's mm. That's not allowable, unfortunately. Would be very handy and instructionally useful and <laughs> an enhancement to your ability to do your job, but nope. <laughs> I think a lot of people do that. Pardon? I think a lot of teachers do that. If you can't come on Monday, just come on Wednesday. Right. And, <laughs> and we get away with it in most cases, uh, but it is a FERPA violation. Oh, wow. On the other hand, if a student, in that case, it would be to protect yourself. What you would want to do is get a written release from the student who came in from the other section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolving you, you know, saying that they understand that, you know, they're personally, that they'll be known to be enrolled in the other section now and that they, they give you, that they absolve you of uh, um, responsibility for that. It would at least probably protect you <laughs> if their parents sue you or something like that oh god knows uh yes shannon on the other hand can student uh share the recording with other students who are not in the same section they're not supposed to okay all right You're, you want to tell them not to do that and that should cover you now yes. you can't stop them from doing that. Okay, okay. Because I do have students share. They just think that 
I mean, they just share the recording with, you know, other students. So, yeah, yeah that's bad. Well, you can't stop that. Sure. Uh, but uh, you don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to be facilitating. Right. So I, I, I should You're tell them. Action. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we let's say we've got the recording running. And then you proceed to narrate your presentation. Let's see how that works. Uh, right, I'll make sure you're seeing what I'm seeing. I wanna kill my share here. And uh, you're not seeing my Zoom screen anymore. You're just seeing my PowerPoint slide. So now I'm going to uh, drag PowerPoint over. There we go. Mm. By the way, if I'm, you see me looking off to the side every now and then. Another te useful technique in a Zoom meeting is to have a second computer or a phone or an iPad or an Android tablet um, joined into the meeting so that you can look over. And if you think to do it, <laughs> you don't forget you've done that. Uh, you can look over and see what your attendees are seeing because it can be what you're seeing and what they're seeing can be different sometimes, as I demonstrated a little earlier. So if I remember to look over here, I can tell what you're seeing and I can make sure everything's working and so on. So that's a useful technique. And it makes, it um, absolves you of the need to keep, continually ask people, can you see that? <laughs> can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. you know what's happening. Okay, so here's PowerPoint. This is the application running, the Office 360, PowerPoint 365 application running. So how do we narrate, how do we deliver the presentation? Well, as you're probably aware, having many of you probably having used PowerPoint for years, you do that through the slideshow ribbon. And um, you have the option to begin from the beginning or from a, you can begin at any point in the presentation if you wish by selecting from current slide and, and changing the current slide over here in your slide navigator. But usually you'll start from the beginning. There are a few options here that you might wanna consider before starting that, particularly when you're doing it in a Zoom meeting. If you have multiple monitors over here, um, you'll see a list of monitors on a little menu here, and you can choose which monitor the PowerPoint slides appear on. If you only have one monitor, that is by definition your primary monitor, and that's where the slides will appear. Um, the But you can, if you have multiple monitors, you can control where the slides appear so that you can have something else on one monitor and your PowerPoint slides on another. And that can be very useful when you're presenting. Or you can just win let Windows choose. <laughs> There's no telling what it's gonna choose. So probably better to make a selection. I'm gonna select primary monitor. And then I'll share my primary screen with you in a moment. You can also choose to use presenter view. And I'm going to uh, select that. The default is to have that on, I think. So you may, if you don't want to use presenter view, you may have to turn it off by unchecking it. But let's mm -hmm. do that. And um, let's proceed to to present. Um, I'll do that just by clicking here where it says from beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, nothing seemed to change on that screen, but now if I share my, and I just canceled that, if I share my Zoom screen or my primary monitor, which I, where I happen to have Zoom, 
now if I start this from the beginning, come on. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Took it a second. Now uh, you are you and your attendees are just seeing the um, the full screen first slide in your PowerPoint slide deck. You yada yada. There's five tips for listening well is the subject of our presentation today. And then you advance to the next slide. Um, if you're using a single monitor and you're just seeing the PowerPoint slide here and you're sharing this image with your students, um, you can advance this slide in a number of ways. Uh, the most commonly used way, of course, is just to left click or uh, yeah, click with the left mouse button on the slide and you'll go to the next slide. You can also use the up and down arrow keys on your keyboard. Uh, down arrow moves you forward in the presentation and the up arrow moves you backward. And that's a little better in some ways. Um, the and of course, you just narrate each slide as you go along. If you need to, and but you're not limited in presenting in Zoom to just showing the PowerPoint slides. You can always interrupt the PowerPoint presentation and bring up something else. Mm -hmm. To interrupt your slideshow, just press the escape key on your keyboard and you'll your slideshow will stop you can start it again at any time and now you can show something else like i could bring in another uh window here and show you that or whatever mm -hmm. i can demonstrate something and then when i'm ready i can go back to powerpoint And I can start the presentation. And let's say I've moved ahead um, to a, a different slide. I can select that slide in the slide navigator and restart the presentation from the current slide. Mm. So I don't have to start at the beginning and, and then run my way up through the, all the slides from the beginning up to where I left off. I can just start it again from start the presentation, the slideshow, from wherever uh, I wish. And I can move on from there. That's how you have to do things if you just have, in a Zoom meeting, if you just have one monitor on your computer. Uh, if you have more than one monitor on your computer, Let's see here. You can use what's called presenter view. And let's see. Best way for me to show you that is to put PowerPoint over here. Yep, you're seeing that. And in slideshow mode, in the slideshow ribbon in PowerPoint, you have this option to use presenter view, which you can turn on and off. If I turn that on and then start my presentation, I want to start that on this monitor. I start my presentation, great. Uh, now you're seeing the same thing I was before. Your attendees are seeing the same thing they were before, but you, if you have a second monitor, can have 
this running. And I've shared my another one of my monitors with you. And this is presenter view. This will automatically, if you have two monitors and you start power and you start a PowerPoint presentation and you have that option to use presenter view selected. This will pop up on one screen and your power full screen PowerPoint slide will pop up on another. You just want to make sure that you have shared the screen with your students that has the full screen PowerPoint slides on it while you see this. You see the current slide that is being displayed to your students. You see the next slide in the presentation, so you don't have to ask yourself, oh my God, what comes next? I've lost my place. I can't remember what I'm going to do next. Um, you also, if you've included speaker notes in your PowerPoint slide, you see those here on the uh, below the next slide. Um, you will see your um, speaker notes. So this is very this can be very helpful to keep you on track and remind you what you intended to say. Always helpful helpful for me. Speaker view also gives you access to some useful tools that you can use during the presentation. You can use uh, you can uh, annotate the presentation using uh, a laser pointer or a pen. And you can draw on the slide while you're presenting. Most of y'all are probably too young to remember who Mortimer Snurd was. He wasn't the smart one. So you have that uh, option. You can. Um, give yourself a slide sorter view at any time so you can see all your slides and see what's coming later and you can navigate to those slides very quickly if you need to jump ahead to a slide you can pop it up really quickly that way you can magnify the slide if this if you disobey those rules about good PowerPoint where you don't use fonts smaller than 24 point things like that and you, you people are having trouble seeing what you're trying to show them during a presentation you can magnify the slide and then move the magnified area around so that people can see what's going on better and then you can take that off just by clicking on the magnifier again. Uh, you can, if uh, you suddenly need to have people's attention, you don't want them reading the slides, you can black out the slide and then bring it back. PowerPoint also has subtitles built into it. Uh, it will do real-time captioning all by itself. So if you're giving a presentation in a, um, in a classroom and you have a hearing impaired student in the classroom, uh, you PowerPoint will provide real-time captions for you if you use this technique or if you use this tool. Um, you don't really need that when you're presenting PowerPoint in Zoom because Zoom has its own uh, live captioning capability, which I have turned on, by the way, if any of you should desire your live captions in Zoom, just click on the little CC symbol down in your Zoom uh, menu bar, and you'll have the option to show, uh, show subtitles. And you'll uh, see what I'm saying as well as hearing it. Dave? Yes. Are you, are you gonna show how to do the captioning from that button? Cause that one's new to me. Uh, yeah, you just turn that on. And oh, okay. I saw starting it. subtitles. And as you present, PowerPoint captions what you say. 
Oh, great. I learned something new every time. And this, like I say, you don't really need this when you're using, when you're presenting in Zoom, because you can use Zoom's live captions, which are actually faster and more accurate than the ones in PowerPoint. Though PowerPoint's not bad, as you can see. But in a live classroom, that would be helpful. But in a live classroom, this could be vital uh, if you have a hearing impaired student. And indeed, you may have students, probably will, at our district, you'll probably have students in there whose uh, birth language is not English. And this will be helpful for them because we all read a language better than we speak it early on or listen to it. Or, you know, and is there a way to adjust the font? Uh, yes, okay. I believe there is. Um, let me turn that off for the moment. You just turn it on and off using that little symbol right there. You can uh, navigate the presentation just by, uh, or you can you can advance your slides just by clicking on the next slide here. Or you have a navigation control here with left and right arrows that you can use to navigate. Just depends on what uh, seems more natural and more uh, helpful to you. So presenter view is a handy thing, but it's what it was originally designed for was a situation where you were presenting live in a classroom or in a meeting room or whatever, and you had your computer attached to a projector, which is in effect a second monitor. And um, PowerPoint would bring presenter view up on your computer and the slides would appear on the projector, which is basically what we're doing in Zoom if we have two screens. You, you, you can have your presenter view on one screen and your full screen slides on the other, and you just be sure to share the screen that has the full screen slides uh, with your students. But um, it, it can be very useful particularly the, um, the speaker notes, if you put those in there, will help you forget, uh, avoid forgetting things that you intended to say. Just makes the whole process a little less stressful for the presenter. Well, you don't have to use presenter view. You can turn it off if you're happy enough. And if you know your slide presentation, you don't need this, you don't have to use it. But it can be handy. All right. I'm gonna, so that's how you present and how you share what you're presenting with your students in, uh, in the Zoom meeting. I'm gonna dump out of this presentation now. He said. Okay. And let's go back to my other PowerPoint slides here. I'm still using presenter view there. And stop that share. And go back. Here we go. All right. I've got too many PowerPoint <laughs> presentations running at one time. All right. Moving on. Hey, yep. Let me stop and ask you a question. Absolutely. On the one you had before, you had at the bottom of a screen, you had where you could uh, use a stylus or you could uh, magnify. Presenter view, right. Presenter view. Because I never had that and I've been doing PowerPoint. Maybe I don't know as often, but I'm supposed to give a presentation on the Saturday the 6th. And I would like to have that. What do, how do I find how that? How do you turn that on? Okay. How do I turn that on? Let's, let's look at that again. Let me pull up. Uh, that PowerPoint here. Okay, you're seeing that. Okay, you go to the slideshow ribbon in the PowerPoint menus where you start the show. And you go over here to this little um, section of the ribbon labeled monitors. And here's the option to use presenter view. Mm. And you just turn that on. 
I assume you're going to be plugging your laptop or a desktop computer into a, a um, uh, projector. So in that event, it would be appropriate to use presenter view. And what will come up on the computer in front of you is the presenter view with the little stylus and all that and all those capabilities that we just saw. But what appear, will appear on the projector is the full screen slide. Hmm. So you do you have to have the second computer to see to use the presenter's view? No, you do have to have a second monitor. Oh, oh, oh second monitor. Second okay. Monitor. If you're presenting in a classroom, the yes. projector is your second monitor. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 Just, all that is uh, that projector just serves as a second monitor to your computer. I see. Okay. And so I could. But if you're so, doing this in Zoom, you need two monitors on your computer itself. You need a, okay. A second monitor attached to your laptop, or a second monitor attached to your desktop computer. Because okay. then you can have the presenter view show on one monitor and the full screen slides appear on a second monitor. And you just make sure that when you share your screen in Zoom, you share the correct monitor with your students, which is obviously not automatic because I've already made that mistake two or three <laughs> times and had to correct it. So when you start doing things like this, you have to accept a certain level of uh, shall we say, um, apparent incompetence. <laughs> you have to be willing to look like an idiot in front of your students, but I'm not telling you anything. You, we've mm -hmm. all lectured for years. We know that feeling. Well, this might affect some other people. This, what I'm doing is run an international training session. I'll be here and I'll be with people in Japan, people in Korea. Oh, wow. The same. And, uh, we do it in twos. One of us does a chat, takes out a chat money, and the other one does the PowerPoint show. Out I was going to, I usually I do the chat, but I was going to do the PowerPoint show. Excellent. I, it depends on where I have to be, where I have the two monitors now. So that's something I had to figure out in that. And I'll uh, talk to the person in Phoenix who will be doing, I don't know who I'll, my second person might be in Phoenix, it might be in Sacramento, and might be in Los Angeles. Wow. And so what I will do, given what you told me, unless I've got two monitors set up and I'll be on a weekend, so I'll be home or, or out somewhere, right. I'll have to probably have them do the, uh, and I would do, and I would do all the chats. Well, and you can, room and that kind of you stuff can like. do this from a single monitor. You just can't use presenter view. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I've right. done it before, but I haven't, I haven't used that little feature you talked about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you. you want to use that feature, you got to run out and get yourself another monitor. <laughs> well, I have the extra, extra computer. I could bring that on and I could do that. Here's a second monitor you told me about uh, that last time. Yeah. If you have a desktop and a laptop, yeah. you can um, use the laptop as a second, as long as they're both on the Wi Fi, on your Wi Fi, on the same Wi Fi network, you can broadcast a second monitor, you can in effect make that laptop display your second monitor. And I did a, a, a training session not too long ago. Let me see if I can find that for you here. This is great. This back and forth is, is wonderful. It's good for everybody. Okay, let's see here. I'll pull up my Google Calendar and show that to you. And I just dragged that over from another monitor. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, when was that? That was ah the 10th of June. So if I go to our on demand, open on demand site where we put all okay. our recordings, sdccdolvid.org there, and go to the workshop archive section, and just scroll down looking for June 10th. There it is, connecting and using multiple monitors on your yeah. laptop, laptop computer. I've got that recording online and I've got a table of, 
started being able to put a table of contents on these things. So if you're looking for something specific. Okay. And here it is. Using a Windows laptop as a second monitor for a Windows desktop computer. Just click mm -hmm. on the time code and that'll show you how to do that. Mm. Okay. And that, that, that's very handy, handy because um, oh, yeah. my my desktop here at, at the district provides, I don't use that for this. It's, 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 it's behind the time. <laughs> so, I, but I use uh, it's, the, the it's, two laptops. It, is yeah. it running Windows 10? Uh, I think it is. I just use my laptop most of the time anyway for anything. Yeah, I hear and you. That, I, if the desktop's running Windows 10, this will work. Yeah. It doesn't require anything special in terms of the computer to do it. Okay. 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 I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try, try it. With that. I'm <laughs> or try you, it. yeah, yeah, you can uh, you can do that. So um, that's a a possible solution. Okay. Um, I run it. I run a test run for it. Cool. Dave. Oh yeah, um, definitely. Practice, practice, practice. Yes, Shannon. Um, can you elaborate on how to use um, projector and the desktop monitor? Desktop computer when I when I'm in the classroom. Okay, um, so you have the podium computer. Yes. And the projector is already uh, connected to the podium computer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, when you're setting up um, uh, your slideshow here. Yes. PowerPoint. Right. You'll have this monitor option here with a little menu because uh -huh. that projector is a second monitor. So oh, I see. you just select it. You select the projector here as uh -huh. the screen on which you're going to show your slides full screen. Okay. And then your if you check use project presenter view. Uh huh. The presenter view will come up on the monitor that's on the podium computer that you're looking at. Right. And your slides will come up on the project. I see. So my my I should. I should identify my projector as the primary. Uh, no, the projector no. will not be your primary. Uh, so how do I do that the projector? This this thing. should tell you. Uh huh. This will say something like uh, projector, Epson projector or something. I like see. That. OK, yeah. OK. You select the projector. Okay. You'll be able to tell which one is the projector. If nothing oh, okay. else, just try it and see. <laughs> <laughs> Try, okay. you know, try something. A trial and error will work too. Right, well, probably right. uh, you will. Um, your primary monitor will be the one on the desktop on the podium computer that you're. Okay. Okay. Why you have that up there? Yes. The, the monitors one, two, and three are that the sequence in which you connected them? That's a really good question. <laughs> because you, you see, you, 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 got, you got monitor one, monitor three, and four. I don't know where two went. Yeah, but you got a primer. Uh, it can be off, hard to tell if you've got three or more monitors. It can be hard to tell which one is. Uh, notice here, it's telling me that monitor one is my Sony TV. Okay, so I know which one that is. I, I that's up here above me. But these two monitors three and four, it just lists like a a, a model number. Yeah. For the like monitor, a, like a panel I have, number. have two monitors with the same model number. It's so like, I like having two different printers. Switch. Okay. So I just have to do trial and error. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Also, I, wish I had better news for you. Also, for those of you that are at the Mesa College, the monitors in most of the classroom because they're the computers are getting kind of old. It can't just be as quick as Dave's computer because Dave's computer is pretty fast compared to what we have. You might have to wait almost a minute for the projector and the computer to kind of sync up and recognize oh, each other. Yeah. That oh, is that's that's oh. really good to know. Yeah, so I have to be patient. <laughs> have to get everything. Never tried that. Okay, that's a yeah. good tip. Patience is important and practice is important. If you're yeah. going to be teaching in a classroom go in there before you have your first lecture where you want to use powerpoint and try everything and see how long you're going to have to wait for things to happen and so on yeah um one of the uh, disadvantages of having 
uh, Office three PowerPoint three sixty five be a a cloud or software as a service application? Is that if your internet connection suddenly chokes because some uh, somebody down in the uh, in another in their office has decided to download a um, you know a, a high definition movie onto their computer or something like that, and your the internet bandwidth suddenly gets used up. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of a delay before things happen, and um, especially if the internet connection is in your building is not the very best, and so on. So. Yeah, you sometimes you have to have a little patience. You may click on something and it may not happen. What you want to happen may not happen instantly. That's a very good point, Kathy. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm working here with the fastest computer that I could afford. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty fast computer. And even then, sometimes things lag a little bit. And I've also upgraded my home network and my internet connection recently. You might notice that some of the slides are a lot clearer than they have been in the past on these shares, though still not perfect. But um, yeah, dealing with the limitations of your technology is something we all have to do. Okay, any other questions about PowerPoint? I'm about to move on and show you how to do the same thing in Google Slides, in case any of you are using that. I'll go through that fairly quickly because that's less likely, I think. And you should all have access to PowerPoint 365 or have, you can get access to it now through your department. So uh, I would, quite frankly- The way I got access to mine, I, I was trying to do something in Google. I mean, they were trying to charge me for it. And I called a district and they were able to lo load it electronically. So they gave you access to uh, to Office 365. Yeah. yeah, that's supposed to happen for all faculty, but they're rolling it out gradually. We're also supposed to finally get student email. So that our students will have a district email account. Um, that's supposed to be coming, that's supposed to be imminent. And that will make it a lot easier to communicate with our students in, in many ways. I also give the students the capability to do things like get their own copy of Microsoft Office for free while they're a student. So that's a big thing coming. I didn't think I'd live to see it. I swore I'd never live to see it. I hope if it does finally happen that I just don't fall over from between one step and the next. But there... They swear it's going to, IT swears it's happening. And our new IT director at the district, uh, Peter Maharaj, is, uh, is a man who gets things done. I've been very impressed. Okay. So if you think of any other questions about PowerPoint, I'll come back to them later. But let's take a look at uh, the, power, the major alternative to PowerPoint uh, that's available to people on any computer. I'm not going to cover Keynote today on the Mac because it's definitely a minor player by comparison to PowerPoint. And it's not something that's available on the, to everyone, only to those who use Macs. So let's look at uh, slides, Google Slides briefly. Okay, how do you present in a Zoom meeting, present a Google Slides presentation? Well, first, of course, you've got to bring up Google Drive and open um, uh, a Google Slides presentation. Uh, we're not going into how to create these presentations today in either PowerPoint or Slides. That's, uh, that's another session that we do from time to time. And uh, we'll do that again sometime fairly, certainly before the beginning of fall term. So if you're a little, it's been a while since you created a PowerPoint presentation, something like that, we'll have some help for you on that. And we do have recordings of, of that session online as well. But um, 
let's bring up Google Slides. You do that just in a web browser. Google Slides is a is a, a online or cloud only present uh, tool. There's no local version of it or anything like that. And you get to Google Drive. The easiest way to get to Google Drive is to just type the URL in the location line of your web browser. And it's just drive.google.com. Pretty easy to remember. Or you may have a, a link to it on your desktop or whatever, but it's not a local application. It's just a website. And here's Google Drive. This assumes, of course, you're logged into your Google account <laughs> when you when you do that. If you're not, you'll be prompted to do so. Google accounts are free. They can be had by anyone. And they have a lot of, the, even the free accounts where you don't pay Google anything, have a lot of uh, capability, uh, a lot of, give you access to a lot of tools like YouTube and uh, hosting and YouTube and Google uh, the Google productivity suite it used to be called Google Docs. And uh, that's what we're in here. And Google Docs includes a word processor, a uh, spreadsheet, and a database, and uh, excuse me, and a uh, presentation package called Google Slides. And when you go to your Google Drive, you'll have, you'll see things that you have um, brought up recently. If you don't find that, you can search Google, your Google Drive for things particularly that you're looking for. You can search for presentations, for instance, and pull up all your Google Slides presentations. You don't have to search through all the word processor documents and spreadsheets and so on. And the one that I want to use right now is this one. So I just click on it. <clears throat> I double click on it, I should say. And the presentation comes up. This looks a little bit like PowerPoint. It's intended to. An example of coevolution. These two applications uh, do basically the same thing in basically the same way, so they look a lot alike. They look as much alike as Google could get away with without getting sued by Microsoft. <laughs> So here we have the slide navigator like we had before and so on. But instead of having a series of ribbons like we do in Microsoft or in PowerPoint 365, we have just menus and we have a slideshow button over here in the upper right, which is how you do your presentations. You don't have as much control over where your slides appear and things like that with uh, uh, Google Slides as you do with PowerPoint. But if I just click here where it says slideshow, the slideshow just starts and it starts on the same monitor that the, uh, excuse me, the application, the web browser was running. I'll bump, dump out of that for a second by just pressing escape. But there are some uh, there are some options that you have for the slideshow here. If you open that little menu beside the slideshow button, you see that you have the option to use a presenter view, which is quite similar to the presenter view in PowerPoint. You also have the option uh, when you start a presentation in Google Slides, you will automatically start on the slide that you have currently selected in your slideshow, uh, in your slide navigator here on the left. So if you're, if you want to start in the middle of a presentation, you just select that slide in the navigator here and click slideshow, and you start with that present. You start with that slide. If you want to start with the first slide instead, you just say start from beginning and you start from beginning. So this is, you have a little less control here, but it's simpler in some ways. The slides are gonna appear on the same screen that the Google Slides application is displaying on. And I don't know that you can change that. 
I don't know of a way to change that. But you do have the option to use presenter view. And if you do that, you get a window that has, that overlays your first slide that has your presenter view in it. Whoops. I'm aggravated. Didn't mean to do that. Just a second. There we go. So you have this presenter view that lays over top of the slide. Now, obviously you don't want that to continue. Um, that's not practical if you only have one monitor. So if you only have one monitor, just as in PowerPoint, you're not gonna be, um, using presenter view. But if you do have a second monitor, you can drag your presenter view off onto another monitor and maximize it. Here, let me share my, um, share that screen with you. All right, there's my Zoom screen. And I'll start my slideshow in presenter view. And I'll drag this over onto the screen I have shared and maximize it. Okay, so now this is what presenter view looks like in. Uh, Google Slides. It's similar. You've got your current slide that's being shown. You've got your next slide, so you can advance the slides by clicking on that. And you've got your speaker notes, if you've created any, over here. You also have some audience tools. Like audience Q&A and things like that, which are a little different. So um, that's basically how you use uh, presenter view in Google Slides. Kill the share there. So we're back on. Yep. Dave? Yes. Uh, some of my students, because I guess because it's free, used a Google Slide in since they're giving their own PowerPoint presentation. Right, have... I can well imagine they would use it. So do is there a tutorial that students can use? That's a really good question. Because I can see that if they're giving their PowerPoint presentation, they would like to see their notes because otherwise it's kind of hard to right. judge. Um, we don't support that. I've been, this is a conversation I've had with the powers that be from time to time. We at the district, we don't officially support the Google products. Yeah. Uh, we're a Microsoft shop. And there is a free version of PowerPoint 365 that your students can use. Anyone can use the free version of Microsoft Office by just webbing to office.com. I'll show that later if you or ask that question again, I'll show that to you uh, later on. Uh, I don't wanna take, I don't wanna run out of time on this presentation, but as always, I'll answer questions as long as you like after the session. But um, so is there a, a good um, tutorial that's, it's, can you, so I, I don't have a set of tutorials online for Google Docs. Okay. or Google Drive and uh, Google Tools. Is there a free way for them to convert? Hmm? Is there a free way? Because there is a way, I know, because some students yes. have done it, but I don't know how to convert to a PowerPoint. Because yeah. I, yeah. That's a good question. You can convert a Google Slides presentation to a PowerPoint presentation. You do that by bringing up the presentation in Google Slides and clicking on the file menu over here. 
and there is a download option. And you can download it as Microsoft PowerPoint. It will okay. convert it to a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation and download it to your local computer. And then you can present that using PowerPoint. Good. And it's free uh, for them. And PowerPoint, a limited version, but a, a perfectly functional version of PowerPoint 365 is available to anyone for free through the office.com site on the web. And again, I'll show that in a little bit. Thank you. I just want to make sure I get through with everything else I've got in the syllabus here. <laughs> um, so yes, that's a good question. All right. Uh, so that's, you know, there's nothing, if you can do, if you can present using PowerPoint, you can do it using Google Slides and vice versa. They're similar enough, but it's not that difficult. So, we, and you go through the same process, which I just did. You minimize or park the slides. If you, and this assumes again, that you have only one monitor. You minimize or park slides on another monitor. You start your Zoom meeting, just like you did with the PowerPoints, share your screen, maximize or drag slides onto the shared screen and hit um, present. You start your Zoom recording if you want to, and then you narrate the presentation. And that's, so it's basically exactly the same things you need to do with PowerPoint. You're just using slides instead of PowerPoint. Um, again, practice ahead of time. Start a Zoom meeting on your computer and go through all of this without any students around to see you make your mistakes. Uh, you know, practice at home, as we used to say, um, before taking it on the road. Uh, you will be, you will be much happier if you do. Any other questions about Google Slides, right? Now? I have one question on use of Google. It use of Google Slides, period. If you uh, reasonably adapt a PowerPoint, um, do I really need Google Slides? No, 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 no. That's just another option. Okay. I'm just, I just try to keep things. You don't need slides. Uh, uh, if slides okay. is an option for people who either hate Microsoft or who don't have the full version of my, of, um, PowerPoint 365, the paid version, because Google okay. Slides is probably a little better than the uh, free version of PowerPoint 365. So, but no, you don't need, if you've got PowerPoint, you don't need to worry about this at all. So I got my 365 from the district, so I assume that's the good version. You're a golden, that is. Okay. Yes. And, and um, you'll be, and you're a contract faculty, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, so you should have the full paid uh all you know the 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 cadillac version or the lexus version i guess these days of it okay since we're talking about, about that what about adjunct faculty what do we have oh yeah well it's free but you gotta log in every single time and well it's originally we thought uh, i thought you were gonna get the same thing no what i'm hearing now and this could change i don't know especially if uh, I'm about to get myself into trouble. I'm going to shut my mouth right now. I think uh, they gave it to us once and then they took it away. You're going to get the, oh God, I hope they just, <laughs> um, you're going to get the free version of Microsoft Office, which basically you could have anyway. And you get, that's a, I will cover that. I'm going to carve out some time at the end to cover that. I want to okay. get some things on this, but that's a very legitimate question. And it's one I wish I had a better answer for, but I'm going okay, to. Okay, I can tell it. It is it is free. You do have to get, get uh, request it from your dean, and they always say yes. But the thing is, you have to, before it was real easy, you just log on, just like the full-time people. But now we have to log on every single time, and you have to prove that you're working that particular semester each time. And I just went ahead and just uh... logged on. It was annoying because it was it slowed everything. Uh, 
so sorry to hear that. Yeah, but it is free. But I mean, you do have to be patient. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Wish we had better news. Um, you know, you know that's good to know because some of us who work with a lot of the faculty and some of the things that adjuncts go through, I we don't know. And I'm glad you explained it to us because I didn't know. I'm will be telling people that it's simple. Thank you very much for that note. Yeah, and then when they took it away, they made it sound like it was all our fault. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I wish it were otherwise. Yeah. Well. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about recording options in Zoom. Because, I mean, you you do these PowerPoint presentations and so you do those online. It'd be nice to make that recording available to your students uh, on demand. It would also be nice not to have to do that presentation yourself quite so many times. I'll never forget the time a colleague came to me, a very a faculty colleague came to me very depressed one day. And he said, I've just computed the number of times I'm going to have to teach uh, English 101 before I die. <laughs> and he was not, not a happy camper. You, you know, you can think, how many times are gonna, am I going to have to give this PowerPoint presentation before I die? Well, the answer, if you record it, it could be once, <laughs> one more time and record it. And you can record these PowerPoint uh, presentations in Zoom, uh, of course, in a live meeting, but then you do have the issue of FERPA and so on. If you have students in there with you, you can always just pull up a Zoom session, start a Zoom session without any students in it and record yourself narrating this presentation and save that recording. And if there are no students in the meeting, then there's no FERPA issues or anything. And you can just put a link to that in Canvas. And when you want your students to uh, uh, view that presentation, you can just you know refer them to the link in Canvas. Or if you're doing a live, I've even done <laughs> when I've been particularly worthless on a particular day, I have even, uh, just in a live Zoom session, you can just have, play the recording and you can turn your video and your audio off and take a nap while the, uh, while the presentation is playing for your students. So there's some real uh, advantages to being able to record these narrated PowerPoint presentations. I think a lot of people do that. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Okay. <laughs> I am live today. Honest to God. Have to hold up a newspaper or something to prove it. Um, so in Zoom, you have good options for recording. By default, in your SDCCD Zoom accounts, you will record to the Zoom cloud. And that's dirt simple. All you have to do to record to the record to the Zoom cloud is hit the record button uh, in your uh, uh, Zoom host menus before you start narrating the presentation. You can do that either from your host menus, or you can do it from the if you're already sharing your screen. You can do it from the uh, share toolbar that you get when you're sharing your screen under more. There'll be an option to start recording here. So um, starting a recording and recording the Zoom cloud is darn near automatic. When the record, when you finish the meeting, the recording is automatically turned uh, uh, tied off and finished in the cloud and uh it takes zoom a little while to process the recording get it ready to share it zoom will send you an email um when the recording is ready and the um it'll include the link to the recording and then you can share that link with your students through canvas or by other means in an email or whatever you wish a, a canvas announcement whatever 
So recording to the Zoom cloud is dirt simple. Uh, that's not something. <laughs> Odd things popping up on your computer in the middle of a presentation. Um, the um, process of recording the Zoom cloud is dirt simple. You do also have the option to record to your local computer, which is what I like to do because I like to maintain control of my recordings. Um, it is something you have to turn on in Zoom, in your Zoom settings, if you uh, choose to do this. It's not, I don't think, automatically uh, activated. But when you do, when you record to your local computer, the recording is being cached on your local computer while you're recording, while you're running your Zoom meeting, whether there's anybody else in there with you or not. And um, the when you finish, when you end the meeting, the recording is automatically processed. You, a little window pops up on your computer. It tells you, I'm processing the recording. And you don't want to turn your computer off while that's happening. It usually only takes a few minutes. And then the recording is stored on your local hard drive in a predictable location. Can you store it on a, a USB drive? You could, uh, you could indeed store it on a USB drive, though you probably... You could store it on a like an external hard drive that was connected via USB. I probably wouldn't set it to, and you can control where Zoom puts that recording initially, but the safe thing to do is to let Zoom put it on your local hard drive. And then if you wanna get it off your hard drive to save space, to copy the recording to a thumb drive or an external hard drive, because um, it's, your bandwidth, the communication bandwidth with your uh, USB connected devices is not as good as the speed with which you connect to your hard drive. So it's better to let it record initially to the hard drive and then copy the resulting recording over the hard, over the thumb drive and then delete it from your hard drive. It's safer that way. You can find these recordings very easily on your computer, these local recordings by going to opening up your uh, file manager. This is the uh, Windows file manager on the Mac, you'd use the finder. And you'll go to your documents folder that you have on both the, uh, your documents library that you have on both the Windows and the Mac. And in your documents folder, you will find somewhere a folder named just Zoom. That's automatically created when the first time you enter a Zoom meeting that gets put on your computer. So you don't have to create that. If you open up that folder, double click on it, you'll see hopefully not this many <laughs> Zoom sessions. Each of these subfolders represents a separate Zoom meeting during which I've recorded something. And, um, uh, during which I've either done a local recording or I've recorded a transcript. And to tell which one is which, you just look at the date, look at the look at the name of the folder. Uh, it's it includes it includes the date that you held this meeting and the time in twenty four hour time. This one was done at this started at um, four o'clock. Uh, 1600 hours. So you find the meeting that you, whose recording you want. Let me find one that's actually got something in it here. That one has something in it. And uh, you'll find a, a series of files in that folder, one of which is uh, labeled video and it has an MP4 extension. That's your video, your local video recording. I double click that, I can play it back. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's... Except I'm playing it on the wrong monitor. Just a second. Come on.
need to change my screen that I am, or I need to share that screen so you can see that. All right, now I'm sharing my Zoom screen. Now I bring that up. So this is that recording. It's a professional development session on advance. So um, I'll close that. So that's all there is to playing that recording. If you want to share that recording with your students, you have to upload it to you uh, to Canvas Studio or YouTube manually and make sure it's captioned there and then then get the link and share the link with your students whatever way you wish. So the process involves a good deal more um, work on your part than just recording to the Zoom cloud. Um, why would you ever care to record locally instead of to the Zoom cloud? Well, you could be, you know, have a, a high, what they call, what the psychologists call a P scale. Anybody know what P stands for? Paranoid. <laughs> so you have a high P scale and you don't want other people having control of your video. Any videographer has a high P scale when it comes to their raw video, they want to maintain control of it because you never know when you're going to need it in the future for something. Uh, absent incipient mental illness, why else would you want to, uh, to have this these local recordings? Well, probably the best reason is that you can edit the recording before you put it online if you so desire. And from time to time, things will happen in Zoom meetings that perhaps you don't want shared with your students or with students in perpetuity, particularly if you have a one of those senior moments like I'm prone to, and you'd like to remove that from the recording. I do that from time to time to make the recording actually cleaner than the live session. So I like to do this locally, but the recording of the Zoom cloud is so easy that most people are going to want to do that. But I think also on Zoom Cloud, your recording, the access expires after a while. Uh, that's not... the good point. That was exactly where I was going next. Our, our, uh, the amount of space we have in the Zoom Cloud is finite. And if you put everything, if you put all your recordings in the Zoom Cloud, there may come a time when we have to ask you to remove the older ones. And now we're responsible for that, or the, the district is responsible for that, I should say. IT and, and Brian Weston are responsible for that now. So they may be saying, okay, that recording has been on there a while. Do you still need it? Are you still using it? Maybe you need to download that and delete it from the cloud, or maybe they have to do it for you because we're running out of space and nobody will be able to use the Zoom cloud anymore. So there has to be some management of that recording space. If you if you record locally and put your recordings up on Canvas Studio or YouTube, that never becomes an issue. So that's one yeah, other you reason. You can't have students in there, can you? I'm sorry? You can't have students in there if you put it on YouTube, can you? No, you do not want to have. Well, yeah, you could. It would just depend, but when you put it on YouTube, you have to select uh, a particular privacy option oh. so that no, you know, just no, the great public can't see it. You can't you use it in the new class, can you? You have to make it unlisted. And then it only students uh, to whom you supply the link can view it. And no yeah. one else can find it on on YouTube. But yeah, yeah you no, you can use YouTube. Though, quite frankly, uh, I would be a little uncomfortable doing that too. Yeah. Though there are advantages to using YouTube, and there are advantages to using Canvas Studio as a hosting ser service. We cover those in another session. But uh, yeah, you can yeah. use YouTube if you wish. May I add something really quick? Uh, quickly, Please. I've heard. And it happened to a faculty member in our department where YouTube removed their um, the videos. 
Ooh. for copyright issues. Copyright even infringement. Though, even though there were no issues in his videos, they they were totally his. But YouTube removed a bunch of his videos, oh, and they're God. not accessible anymore, even to him. He could yeah. not download them. So it's always, even if you post on YouTube, it's always a good idea to to keep a copy. Oh, you want to keep a backup, absolutely. And if you've recorded locally, you automatically have that backup. Um, yeah, I hadn't. Uh, so the YouTube has an automated process, a daemon that checks a video when you upload it to YouTube. And that demon uses an algorithm to determine whether or not that's a copyrighted, a commercially copyrighted video. And apparently in this case, it that algorithm flunked. It incorrectly identified his videos as copyrighted videos and it took them down. Yow. Upset about that. And yep. getting something like that reversed is like <laughs> requires an act of Congress. So that's and, interesting. I am Canvas does that also. And like I owned a video. It was one I created, but it was one that I owned. I got as an instructor. I had permission to show it, but right. it was originally on VHS and the AV right. department helped me convert it. And then they took it down this semester when I wanted to show it. I mean, I've been showing it for and several years. And the studio years. did that? Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't created. In, I don't know if they created in Canvas Studio. They they created it for me and I put it on Canvas. <coughs> but and they you, took it down. Did yeah. you, where did you upload it? Oh, you you uploaded the video to Canvas? Well, yeah, it was it was from VHS to Canvas. I right, think they, right, right. I understand. But, but where was the video hosted for students to view online? I mean, where was the actual video file hosted? That's a complex question. Did you actually upload the video file to the Canvas LMS or did you put it on Canvas Studio or did it you- It wasn't on Canvas Studio, so it must have been the, uh, the other one you mentioned. YouTube? No, no, not YouTube. Right, Canvas LMS. That's interesting. I hadn't heard of that happening. Yeah. That's curious. Okay. It's like, and I didn't get a warning beforehand, like saying, oh, right? No, they they're. Rude. And I can't find the yeah. original because it's a VHS, and the AV department had to help me convert it. Convert it. Did have recorded it to your own computer. Well, now this was a different situation. This didn't involve Zoom. Uh nuts. Yeah. I know you don't want to spend a lot of time, but I was just letting other people know you because you be careful if there's videos that you've had and well, you thought, oh, you, for years. You don't ever want to upload a an actual video file to the Canvas Learning Management System because it. it's not designed for that. Um, you want to use Canvas Studio instead, but I've never seen Canvas Studio. Yeah, and then the people calling it a copyright thing. And and I've I've put copyrighted videos onto. Yeah canvas studio to for some um uh, behind the scenes use i don't share them publicly but and i've never had that happen on canvas studio that's interesting yeah so i don't know how i because i think i can protest it because i the the school, oh no no you can't uh, can unfortunately you can't that's still a violation of the digital millennium copyright act even though you own the VHS tape, you don't actually own the video. You have a you buy a license to use the video for personal consumption. You don't get a the right to put it online and use it in a class or broadcast it through Zoom or whatever. Uh, that's a nasty little legal. Oh, so even though they gave me permission to show it in the classroom, because I do have permission for that. Yeah, but that's different from, you do have the right to do that under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You don't have the right to put it online. Oh. Got sold out in those negotiations in Congress. Okay. Yeah. Now I got to find the original then. Now you got to find the original, do the whole thing. That could stuff. be it's VHS. It could be melted in the garage somewhere. Uh, you're right, and try to find a VHS player. Well, let we can talk about that some more in a minute. Oh yeah, I oh, sorry. You got it. Um, I will just mention that when you're recording in Zoom, whether you're recording to your local computer or to the um, uh, cloud, that 
if you want to pause your recording for a moment and not have something show up on the recording and then start it again, you can use, um, there's a, let's see, what are you seeing right now? There is a pause button when you're recording, either to the cloud or to the local computer. There's a pause button you can use. And then you just have to remember to start the recording again after you pause it, if you wish to do so. You can also pause it on a Windows computer by holding down the alternate key on your keyboard and hitting P. And that will pause your recording. And then alternate P again will um, start it up again. So it's occasionally useful to be able, particularly if you're narrating a PowerPoint presentation, you may, and you're just using Zoom to record it, and you don't have anybody else in the meeting with you, you can use alternate P, <coughs> excuse me, to, um, like when you finish a slide, you can pause the recording and gather your thoughts for the next slide. And then alternate P again to start your recording back up. And uh, that way you don't have to do everything in one take, as it were. <laughs> so that's useful. All right. Let me clear the share there. All right. Um, let's see. That's probably everything I wanted to uh, talk about recording on. There are a couple of enhancements we can talk about for your PowerPoint presentations in Zoom. Um, one is Zoom live caption, which we've talked about just a little bit before, but uh, have not looked at specifically. In your Zoom host menus, when you are, when it's your Zoom meeting and you started the Zoom meeting, which I'm going to share with you now, The, uh, there is an option labeled live transcript. If as the host, you click on that little CC symbol there, you have an option here at the bottom of the screen, bottom of this box that pops up to enable auto transcription. The reason it says disable right now is that I enabled auto transcription before you all before the session started. I always try to remember to do that in case somebody needs it. Because I never know, we have lots of faculty members who are hearing impaired, particularly over at Mesa and the ASL program. And occasionally they'll drop in here and I wanna make sure that they can get the live captioning if they need it, if I remember. And um, anyway, the, this button would say, if you hadn't enabled auto transcription, this button would say enable auto transcription. You just click that. Then you as an attendee can click on the CC symbol and there will be an option to show subtitles. And once you do that, the automatic captions appear. Uh, you can move them around the screen if they get in the way. They're very fast and phenomenally accurate. I like to do that, but they'll even pick up words like phenomenally. It is good if you enunciate as carefully as possible and speak up, but the captioning is really incredibly accurate. Not perfect, but incredibly useful. 
And this is something that uh, you can use in when you're presenting your PowerPoint presentations. And this live captioning is better than the live captioning built into PowerPoint or Google Slides. Google Slides has live captioning built in as well if you're using them in a classroom. But if you're you, doing your presentations through Zoom, uh, the uh, Zoom live captioning in my experience is better. And it is closed captioning, so it can be turned off by hiding the subtitles at any time. So no one is subjected to the captions if they don't want them. So that's a great uh, presentation enhancement that you might use when you're presenting your PowerPoint slides in Zoom. Question. Um, yes. The, so uh, the closed captioning is happens only in English, right? Yeah, unfortunately. Th to my knowledge, Zoom does not yet offer closed captioning in other languages, automatic subtitles in, uh, in other languages. I wouldn't be surprised to see that show up in the future. Good question. But if you upload it to YouTube, you can. Yeah, if you can get captioning in other languages if you upload in uh, on-demand video not in live Zoom sessions, but on, in on-demand videos. If you upload your, um, if, if in fact you're speaking another language in your PowerPoint presentation and you upload that recording to either Canvas Studio or YouTube, you can have the recording automatically captioned in a variety of other languages. If you use YouTube, it's like 70 some languages or something. It will, uh, it will uh, uh, produce captions. In. Also, another you can't question. Get that live in a Zoom meeting yet. Thank you for answering that. I have another question. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I notice because I record my video lectures for a year now, mm -hmm. and um, most of the time, I would say ninety-eight percent of the time, um, the the Zoom will give me a, a text file to go with the, the video file, mm -hmm. but sometimes it doesn't. And I just wanted to ask if you know what it depends on. Are you recording to the Zoom cloud? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. There's an option in Zoom that I will show you in just a moment. There's a setting in Zoom that controls that. And it's possible that setting accidentally got changed. That that can happen sometimes in Zoom, particularly during this migration process. We've seen that in some people's accounts. Zoom settings have been changed for no apparent reason. No yeah, one. Yeah, they, they put up. They put up. Let me let me deal with that. Let me deal with that in just a minute because I, I know there are folks here who want to, who uh, probably are going to need to leave at noon. And I want to make sure I get through the rest of the, the scheduled presentation, and then I'll come back to that, okay? And, you, and I will stay around as long as you have questions. There is another trick you can use that's built into Zoom, and it's similar to what you're seeing with me right now. You're seeing me um, floating over my PowerPoint slides here as a little uh, inset video or a, uh, a, a video that's being keyed over top of the PowerPoint slides. There's actually a way to do that. I'm, and I'm doing that using something other than Zoom, but Zoom has that capability built in. It's not quite as powerful, but it works. Um, so you can have things like this. Uh, going on in your Zoom presentations. You do that through the Zoom, your Zoom screen share. Uh, I'm going to share my Zoom screen for a second to illustrate that. Now you're seeing my, or in a moment, you'll be seeing my Zoom screen. There we go. Um, if you want to do something like this, you can go to your share screen button as the host. And when your um, share control screen or your share selection screen comes up, your dialog box comes up that allows you to pick what you want to share, 
there's an advanced tab at the top of the screen that you may not notice from time to time. If you click on that, you have several advanced screen sharing options, which we talk about in other presentations. But the one I'm talk going to talk about today is PowerPoint as a virtual background. In order to make use of this, I'm going to need to change how I what I'm sending to you in Zoom right now in the way of video. So let me do that first. I'm going to go to my primary camera here so you just see me. And I'm going to kill off the chroma key. All right. Now I'm this is what you would see if I were this is what the camera is pointed at me is actually seeing and not, it's not being massaged in other places. I happen to be sitting in front of a green screen. That makes this work a lot better, but it is not required in Zoom. If you, uh, you can do what I'm about to show you in Zoom, as long as your background is not too busy, there's not a lot of different uh, objects visible behind you. A, a nice featureless wall, whether it's green or not, is a, is a good option. Um, especially uh, if you don't have too many colors. If you have a, a, a very highly colored background with different colors, this is not going to work well in Zoom without a green screen behind. But chances are it will work, if not as perfectly as well as I'm going to show you now. The green screen behind you is, is the ideal circumstance. And you can get a, a green drape, a green piece of green cloth, of the right color for as little as eight or nine dollars on Amazon and hang it up behind you on a coat rack or a door or something like that. And you can get very much the same um, quality of display that I'm about to show you here through Zoom. So how do I do this? Let me get that share toolbar out of the way. We don't need that. Okay, um, I go to share screen. I go to advanced and I select PowerPoint as virtual background and then click share. It asks me, all right, which PowerPoint presentation do you want to use as a virtual background? Um, let's see, I'll just pick one at random here and open. And there I am. <laughs> and this is happening entirely through Zoom. I'm not using any other software, or any other capability, any other hardware or anything. This is happening through Zoom. You see me, I'm talking to you, and you see my PowerPoint slide. I have a little, you can't see it, it's not shared with you, but I have a little um, tool or a little pair of little left and right arrows uh, on the bottom center of my screen that I can use to advance and retard my <laughs> presentation, my slides. But your students can see you and your slides at the same time. They can get your facial expressions, your gestures, your that 70% of communication that is nonverbal, and your PowerPoint slides at the same time. So it's very much like what the experience they would get in the classroom if you're doing this live. But you can do it through Zoom. And it doesn't require learning to use any other software or any other capabilities at all. And uh, it's really pretty cool. You even have the capability, which I can't really show you here, to make yourself bigger or smaller or move yourself around the screen. I'm doing this all through Zoom. So uh, it's really a pretty cool capability. <coughs> and it will work only with PowerPoint. It's, uh, it has to be a PowerPoint presentation. It won't work with a slides presentation. 
but as we saw, if you if you create your presentations in slides, it is possible to download them as a PowerPoint presentation. Then it would work with us. And this is so, uh, yes. We could take like our old PowerPoint slides, but make it a background, but record it in Zoom and then save it, and then students can see it at a different time and can't like save it in Canvas. Absolutely. Okay. But and that's a great thing to do. But we would have to use Canvas Studio or YouTube or something to uh, close so, caption because we have to. Video, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, indeed. And that's another session. <laughs> that's okay. another, uh, but yes, you can do that. And you can record this. This is being recorded right now. This will be in the recording of the Zoom session because I started my recording before I did this. So this is really a pretty cute little trick. And it's something you can do for free with nothing but Zoom that you already have access to. All right, I'm gonna kill that share. And here's what I'm, what you're actually seeing for me. When I'm doing this, I need to adjust something here before I go back to that. When I'm doing this, I am using a different tool, which gives me additional capabilities. Um, and I'll just, I always try to sell this a little bit. Um, I'm using Open Broadcaster Studio right now, which is a virtual video studio, software-based video studio that I can use with Zoom and PowerPoint like this and give, um, have lots of other capabilities in addition to being able to put myself over top of a PowerPoint slide like this. Uh, OBS is a marvelous adjunct to Zoom and your Zoom meetings. It can allow you to, um, present yourself in all sorts of guises, like there I am. Uh, looks like I'm sitting in front of my back window. And that's a, a video camera, the feed from a video camera pointing out my back window with me keyed in front of it. This does require a green screen. I'm using Open Broadcaster Studio to do this. I have that running on another of my monitors. This is Open Broadcaster Studio is another reason to have more than one monitor on your computer because you can have it running on a, another monitor. This is what it looks like. And it will output whatever you, you see in the preview window here in OBS to Zoom very simply. And I just have all sorts of different way, things that I can uh, share with you this way. It's basically a software-based version of the video studio they have in the network trailer parked outside the stadium for Monday night football. It's not quite as sophisticated as that. On the other hand, it's completely free and just requires a little setup. And it's not something that's um, inaccessible to anyone. We do offer periodic sessions on how to do this, live sessions. And we have lots of recordings online how to do this. Notably on our on-demand site, if you, go, if you just go into the on-demand site, we have this little um, slideshow at the top of the site and there's an OBS series there that you can click on and go into. And you, there are a series of tutorials here on how to get started with OBS, how to download it and install it. It's completely free, runs on both PC and Mac, and how to set it up and use it with Zoom. So if you want to be able to do things like I'm doing here where I'm sharing, uh, I'm, I've got myself keyed over top of a web browser window. I can 
do things like that. Uh, whereas with Zoom's capability, the only thing I was able to do was put myself over top of my PowerPoint slides. But with OBS, I can put myself over top of just about anything I can bring up on another computer monitor. So um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, we do have online resources and we do, op uh, we do offer live training uh, periodically. And that uh, it's realistic to learn how to do this in a couple hours. Uh, session lasts a couple hours, just like the one today. And Dave? that pretty much finishes what I had to say today. Yes. So now I'll open the floor for questions of all sorts. And I haven't forgot about the Zoom setting we were talking about. Or, yeah. Dave, Dave yeah. in the scenes where it says primary screen and me, is that a default setting or something you created? I created. Oh, okay. You have to set all that up. Yeah, let me kill that chair. <laughs> there we go. You have to set all that up. It's so the scenes not, come blank. Uh, it comes blank. Okay. <laughs> it takes, but when I do that OBS seminar, I wipe OBS off my computer and then I reload it and I set it up again from scratch live. And if I weren't explaining how to do it, I could do it in 15 minutes. I could set it up again in 15 minutes. It's not difficult or time consuming once you have played with it a little bit. So it's not <clears throat> something that's beyond anyone, but it does take a little, there is a little bit of a learning curve. Yes. Could you put in the chat the um, getting into uh, video on demand? I have on another notes, but I got a new notepad. Absolutely. The uh, on-demand site is yeah. at http colon, and I'm, helps me if I move my lips when I'm typing, http colon forward slash forward slash sdccdolvid.org, org. And there it is in the chat. Okay, now I promised a moment ago, first question was, uh, how to make sure that uh, you get that transcript file um, and and you get captions with your cloud recordings in Zoom. To make sure that that's going to happen, you need to go to your um, Zoom management screens at which you can access at zoom.us. You just open up a web browser, go to the lo go to the uh, URL or location line at the top of the screen, type zoom.us and press enter. This is true no matter uh, where you um, get your Zoom account from. <coughs> Excuse me. You sign in using the credentials for your SDCCD Zoom account. Yours will be almost certainly be your sdccd.edu email address. Um, and then your password and you sign in. And that takes you to your Zoom account management screens. And it knows this is your account because you've logged in. You go to settings in the menu over here on the left. And there are recording settings here across the top of the page. There are meeting settings and recording settings. You select recording. And under cloud recording, you scroll down. There's quite a few cloud recording settings. So you can really mess up your cloud recording if you're not careful. Um, but the one that you want to make sure is checked is create audio transcript. And if that is checked, you should get both the transcript or the, the captions file, the transcript file, and the live captions uh, or the, um, the closed captions, pardon me, in your uh, recording. Very occasionally, that may not work. If the sound quality is poor, or if like your your volume was is is way low on your uh, uh, on your what you're transmitting to Zoom, 
sometimes the, the uh, transcription fails. Doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Uh, also, if you um, if there's a lot a lot of silence at the beginning of the uh, recording, if you like start the recording, you don't say anything for a while. Sometimes Zoom will assume that there's not going to be any speech to convert, and it'll just stop the the um, it, it won't do the transcription. So make some noise at the very least at the beginning. Say something near the when you uh, not long after you start the recording. This will happen with YouTube as well. So those are a couple of reasons why you might not get a transcript, even if you have this option checked. But for sure, you want to make sure that option is checked. And I've I've already had one other person tell me when their account was migrated, this was turned off. For no apparent reason and i i love zoom and it's incredibly reliable but from time to time i have had settings change on my zoom account that i didn't change i don't know if it was changed by somebody at the state accidentally or if um you know they may have changed it on a bunch of accounts without realizing it or whether something just happened at zoom but from time to time, you may have to go in and check your Zoom set. This is particularly true with passcodes on your Zoom um, uh, meeting rooms. If you go to meeting settings and look at the security settings here, like sometimes one of these will get turned on for no apparent reason. And suddenly there'll be a passcode on your meeting that you didn't put there. You yeah, don't that's even what know happened what it to is. Me. Uh, yeah, it's, ha it's happened to me too. And um, you can go in here and change that. Like if a passcode gets set on your um, personal meeting room, you can go to meetings, personal room, and you can take, you can edit that Oh, I can't I can't edit this while I'm in a meeting, but you can edit that and take the passcode off here. So um but they said then my my recordings will get mixed up between my between my classes. Well, when the when the recordings are sent to the cloud, they're just the topic is not always meaningful yeah you get the start time and uh, and so on so you can but the, give you an idea of which class meeting it was right but it's uh it's easy to get confused about which recording is which well but i think it's the only way you have to, use isn't it? to identify them is by date and time okay I've never seen it actually switch one, but I, I'm not going to say it's impossible either. <laughs> okay. So that's anyway, okay. that's where you find your Zoom uh, cloud sure. recordings. Thank you. You bet. Is on um, your Zoom management screens under recordings. Right. That's where they're listed. And if you need to download them or delete them or something like that, that's where you go. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, there have probably been some questions put into the chat. And then when it's just me, I usually can't really monitor the chat. But let me check with those. Had trouble with the link in the email. Darn. I've had people tell me that, uh, or yeah um i'm not sure what's happening there it doesn't seem to be happening to most people so I'm, I'm just, maybe it's my computer oh i don't know it's it's hard to know okay that's about all that was in chat so let me ask if you have some other questions that i haven't <laughs> dealt with today uh, something i promised to come back to and forgot let me know <laughs> i think i'm supposed to click on something to record the 
record the transcripts to the cloud. That's yeah, that's that um, option I that setting I showed you a moment ago. Okay. Uh, under the settings. Yeah. Dot us under settings recording. Be sure that create audio transcript is checked. Okay. Yeah. And I, I had somebody two days ago tell me, all of a sudden my recordings aren't being transcribed. What happened? Oh. This had gotten turned off during the migration. Mm. It was set when before the migration, you had this turned on and it when it migrated, it turned off. And I've seen that happen when people update their Zoom client too. I've seen mm -hmm. settings change on the website when they updated their Zoom client. I've had it happen to me. All right. So I should check it because I think my last recording was not. Um, yeah, you you want to go in and check that and make sure. And uh and also, you might just do it like a dummy Zoom meeting and uh, or, a, you know, a test Zoom meeting yeah. and uh, speak for a little while and then save the recording and check and see if the transcript is there. Because it could be something to do. Maybe your microphone wasn't putting out enough or something like that. You want to know about that before it happens in a live meeting that you want the captions on. So test it and make yeah. sure it's working and if you're having trouble email me and we can get together on zoom and see if we can troubleshoot it on a one-on-one -on -one zoom meet i'm always happy to do that with anything so just email me and ask for that and we'll set up a time all right well, dave, dave i have a question good uh i think i understood you to say that if i have a if i own a video and I want to show that to my class, I can't do it. Not online, because you don't own the video. What you own oh, is a personal I, display license. Okay. Unless so, you created the video yourself. Then no, no. But I can do that in the classroom. In you person. can do it in the classroom, but you can't do it online. That's, as I mentioned to Kathy before, we got sold out in the negotiations okay. back in 1997, I think it was, for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act between, you know, there were a bunch of interested yeah, yeah. parties, the, the entertainment industry, the Motion Picture Association of America, and um, educational organizations, and copyright holders were all involved. And the negotiation, what they finally settled on for educational use of copyrighted videos was that if you use them and if you bought a license and you use them in a physical classroom it was legal but if you wanted to use it online either in a live meeting or in an on-demand uh situation it wasn't yeah, not legal. recording anything it's just a synchronous class the only difference between it doesn't, is, matter. doesn't matter yeah um it's it is um technically against copyright law so the question is do i get caught or my little halo okay we're back on the record um and does anybody have a question that I can answer without turning off the recording? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, and I'll take questions on anything. It doesn't have to be uh, Zoom and PowerPoint related at this point in time. Uh, if you've got something else about Canvas or anything else I can help you with, please feel free to bring it up. All right. Well, the new button in Canvas. Okay. When I click in there, that's where it looks like recordings are are stored. Are you talking Canvas or Canvas Studio? No, I'm talking to Canvas. There's a button, the new button that says. Let's see if we can find that button. You want me to show you? Uh, yeah, that would solve that. Let me make sure you have share. Yeah, you can. Let me know. I'm not sharing my screen. You can go ahead and share your screen if you don't mind. All right. 
All right, where is it? I'm not sure exactly which button you're referring to. I don't want me desktop, huh? Sure, okay. My desktop is going to be you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, am I going somewhere here? I'm going somewhere. I'm not going to share your screen yet. I'm not? Nope. Got to punch know. that share the green share screen button. And I then did. Now I'm out. So select I'm out. screen one or screen the full screen at the top left of the white box. All right. Well. And then click share in the lower left, the little blue share button in the lower right. I'm somehow sorry. I'm really out of here now. Oh, now I'm back. Okay, I did. I I I did that. And the blue box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me show you. Let me share my screen. Share right. with sound too. Okay, oh. I'm sharing my Zoom screen now. Open you system. Click the software. green button. Why is it doing this? It's telling me security and privacy. What's going on? Oh, because uh, I'm sharing right now. Oh. And, wow. and if you look, you just click this icon in the upper left hand corner and then click share i did already and then <laughs> now let me stop my share and you try that all right sound share open system preference allow zoom to share your screen oh my now, giving me security that's what it's doing Oh my, uh, are you on a Mac? Yeah. Oh gosh, there's a Mac security setting you have to change in order uh, in the latest couple of Mac OS. Yeah. Oh shoot, and I don't have that up right now. Nuts. So like um, do me a favor and send okay. me an email. All right. Uh, asking me to do a tutorial on that. All right. um, I, that's been on my list for a while. I haven't got that one done. I I don't think we can. I can walk you through it right now, without right. my Mac up because I only use the Mac infrequently. Um, but I'll find you, or I'll I'll either make a tutorial or I'll find one All for right. you online, and send it to you. But that doesn't help us right this minute. Let me pull up Canvas and see if we can, if you can guide me to where you're seeing that button. Oh, okay, all right. All right. Uh, let's see. Yep, that's go to Canvas. And log in. There we go. And is this button inside a course? Yes, yeah, inside the course. Okay, let me pull up a sandbox course here that didn't have anything confidential in it. All right, now student, where do I need student it? view? Student view? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Now I'm in student view. Yeah, I don't see it on yours. And what does it say? Well one of these buttons under home says it says sdccd zoom yeah oh that'll be here, over here on the left yeah um there it is sdccd zoom yeah that's it and if i click if i click that in student view it's not going to work well it did i'll be damned i wouldn't have thought it would have worked all right so then do it in do it in your view too to see what's going on because I think they're going to get everything. If you, whenever oh, no, you no. use the Zoom room, it's going to be there. No, they will not be able to see your Zoom recordings. Um, the uh, only, they'll only be able to see your Zoom recordings if you deliberately and overtly share the link to your Zoom recordings. With well, this no. is right there. Cloud now, let, me, let me do this with a, um, oh yeah, there's a cloud recording tab, but <laughs> it's not gonna, uh, let me log in as an actual student. 
and okay. show you what's going to happen. that uh, student view can be misleading in some cases. Well, I would- right, Here's an actual do. student account that I'm logging in with now. And if I go to a course, let's see, where was that one? Shoot. It disappeared. <laughs> See the new button. Well, my, well, I'm just looking for that particular sandbox course. This one will do. That's fine. There's nothing right. un, too embarrassing in there anyway. Um, yeah, I'm in there. Now, uh, if SDC, yeah. if I click SDCCD Zoom uh -huh. and go to cloud recordings, it seemed like it was the same. That's what, what I'm asking. It's not about. gonna let, uh, well, let me select the date. No, it's not gonna show them your recordings because I have cloud recordings in there from, um, indeed from further back than that, if I go back. But it looks like it would. It looks like that's the place for the students to go to get the recordings. That's what it looks uh, like. Only the cloud recordings made from this course. It's not going to show them your Zoom recordings All right. uh, at any at any time. Because if I do this as me, my recordings show up. But Zoom knows that this knows who's logged in here through the SDCCD Zoom app. And yeah. it's not going to show someone the intimate details of your Zoom account. If that student has their own Zoom account, it may show them, and they have recorded cloud recordings in there, it may show them that. It will show. Them. Oh. Okay. But it's not going to show them your recordings because Zoom, the SDCCD Zoom apps app knows who's logged into Canvas. Okay. It's connected to Canvas. It's not going to show them your recordings. All right. Okay. Yeah. Of that, I am. Because there was some, I just deleted them all because I didn't know what they were. Yeah. And if you don't need them, I mean, we appreciate you deleting yeah, well, them if you don't need them. But, yeah, I just thought well, it was weird. But they said but I was going to lose them all. Record class meetings. I just thought it was me going the, into the uh, Zoom room. Through the SDCCD Zoom app. Yeah. And those the cloud recordings that you make in sessions that were scheduled through the SDCCD Zoom app mm -hmm. will appear here. Right. But only to the account owner. Okay. Account owner. So you don't have to worry about them seeing recordings in your Zoom, cloud recordings in your Zoom account that they did not, uh, that you made. Uh -huh. uh, they cannot access them through here. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that would be a fairly serious security breach. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Can our students get free Zoom accounts? Your students can get free Zoom accounts, not through SDCCD, oh, okay. but through Zoom. All I have to do is go to zoom.us. Oops, I'm logged in, just a second. It's not gonna show me that. If I log out, there's a button right here that says sign up, it's free. And they just click there. They confirm their date of birth. I'm going to put something bogus in here. <laughs> and like basically, they're confirming that they're over 13 years old. And they just put in an email address. 
I've got accounts under all those email addresses, so I can't do it. But they put in their email address and click sign up. Okay. And they go through a little verification process where they Zoom verifies that they're a human being and not a robot, a web bot. And they can have a free Zoom account that they can use as much as they like. But it's only 40 minutes at a time, right? Well, it's yeah, it's got a few minor limitations on it. Your meetings can only last 40 minutes. But what they don't tell you is that you can just start another meeting right at the end of the first one and keep going. Say, so, okay, it's going to time out. I'm going to, when it times out, I'll restart the meeting, just come back in again. They can make someone a co host because that's what happened when I had a Zoom meeting and yeah. I wasn't running out of time, but I was like maybe safe when well, I classes back to back. Yeah. The meeting will end and everybody will be kicked out, but then you can just start another meeting and invite people back to that. And you can keep going 40 minutes at a time all day. Okay. So that's it's not that group. much of a limitation. Uh, if, wouldn't it be nice if our Zoom accounts were limited to 40 minutes and our meeting and our, the administrators couldn't hold meetings for more than 40 minutes at a time on Zoom? Yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Forget it. We have Zoom Pro accounts, which don't have that limitation. Also, they can't do polling or breakout rooms. They can't host a meeting that uses polls or breakout rooms in those free accounts. And there's a few other limitations, not that many. Actually, Zoom gives it away. My God, they give you a very functional free account that many people get by on for years without buying anything from Zoom. And so that's costing Zoom a fair bit of money, but it's such wonderful marketing, I guess, that they continue to do it, particularly given that we're still in the throes of the pandemic and people are using Zoom to stay in touch. So someday they may stop doing this, but right now they give away a very functional uh, Zoom account that um, anyone can have. You can have multiple Zoom accounts and use them for different purposes if you have multiple email addresses, which most of us do. Did you say so, they couldn't host? How could they not host if it's their oh, Zoom no, account? No, you can host a meeting from a oh. free Zoom account. You just can't do polls or uh, breakout rooms or uh, and you can even record. Well, they don't have as, as many... Um perks as the other one does no they don't have as many perks as our pro accounts have but they got an awful i'd say they probably have 85 to 90 percent of the functionality we have because it'd be great for a study group it'd be great for a study group indeed students can make their own zoom accounts and meet for study groups or other purposes <laughs> a lot of that that goes on on zoom too <laughs> Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, you might be a little careful. Somebody sends you a Zoom link in the email or something like that. Be careful clicking on it. You don't know what you're going to see when it comes up. But um, the uh, uh, yeah, the, this is one of the best freebies on uh, in the world right now is a free Zoom, uh, what they call an unlicensed or a, a free account, uh, a basic account. Uh, is one of the best deals out there because you can do so much with it. I I could do what I'm doing on a free account if I just didn't mind restarting my meeting every 40 minutes because I don't use polls or breakout rooms that often. So it's a uh, it's heck of a deal. And I would encourage my students to do that because they can use it to talk to their friends in Timbuktu. Uh Anytime they wish. It is perfectly well, legit for us to tell them to get their own account sure. too. Okay. What they're, I know uh, is, uh, you know, they're they meet Zoom's minimum requirements, so they got to be over. I think they have to be thirteen or older to do that. So none of our students are, unless you've got a prodigy in one of your classes. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. So I, I don't see any particular reason why you couldn't mention that to students. I I have a tutorial under student resources on the on-demand site that shows them how to create their own um, 
free Zoom account. So I noticed that the international link is missing now up the on the oh, invitation. Yeah. yeah, they they took that international phone number out of the invite. Yeah. For Zoom. Yeah. I'm, I, that's probably been done at the account group level at the sd-edu level and i don't know why there are that went that there is a list of a zoom x dial-up numbers all around the world that i assume would still work with one of our sessions because that's internal to Zoom. It doesn't have anything to do with our account group. Well, I don't know. Was the link to the other Zoom. Day. Let me see if I can find that again. Zoom international phone numbers. Well, there, did it have to be a phone number? I thought it was a link, an internet link. Well, no, an internet link will work from anywhere. It doesn't matter well, where the student is; well, they can attend your meeting. There's if you send them an invite link, but if they want to dial in and do the audio on their telephone instead of using computer audio, because maybe their computer doesn't well, have speakers or something. Yeah, but the old invitation had a. Had I a, know the old invitation had an international access number, right? And it's it's vanished, and I don't know why. But here are dial-up numbers for all around the world. Oh, okay. Um, um, well, let hmm. me see. I think that's... Hmm. There were numbers there the other day when I looked at that. Why is that showing yeah. up that way? Let me move that to another screen and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Oh my darn. Are they missing? Yeah, they were there just the other day. I know things are going up. Going up. <laughs> That's weird. All right. So you're going to make a t tutorial on how to, how to share my screen with my yeah, dad. Yeah, I hear you nuts yeah all right well i guess oh I there's did. somebody who's published a list of them they did yeah well i don't see it I, and i don't know if that's current or not or whatever but that's something they might try let me uh send you that link oops don't have that on the right screen there we go just found that mm -hmm. and i'll let me send that link to you in chat oh, okay um i don't know why those wouldn't work if a student needed to access this audio from a foreign country all right, because I had people that that came to my classes from um, Japan. Oh yeah. And now they'll and... still be able to you to utilize the invite links that you send, okay. and if they're using computer audio, they should be able to participate fully in the meeting. It doesn't matter where it's they just are. The phone people, right? It's just the people who need to dial in to get the audio on their telephones. That oh, need I see. Maybe they think nobody has to do that anymore well if they have if they're like using a smartphone that has a speaker and a microphone in it they don't have to use this right they can just come into the meeting using the invite link and they'll be able to hear you and you'll be able to hear them and so on if they're you know halfway around the world there may be you know the sound quality may suffer depending on their uh, local phone network and so on but if they still should work, um, but I don't know um, why that international number vanished from our invite. I have no idea. I intend to ask. <laughs> right. I know who I can ask, and I will do that the next time we have a staff meeting. <laughs> right. This would be something good to post in Canvas, probably, huh? Yeah. All right.
it's right, well, it's I publicly think... available on the web. I don't see how you can get in trouble by doing so. So, all right. Well, I guess I'm going to have to practice and and then get back to you. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for helping me. Well, I'm always happy to do so if I can, if I can. And uh, it's great to talk to you all today. All right. Bye, Dave social life i have anymore so <laughs> i'll take right, well, care thanks again thanks for coming